Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys, welcome back to the Equip You Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and with us today is a, is another Dave, a, a returning guest, our, our friend David uh, De Brun, right? Did I get that right? The brain. Brain? Yep, brain okay. is in brain. Brain. Okay, yep. great, great. I, I do get names wrong, guys, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, welcome back to the show, brother. Can you uh, catch us up on uh, what's happening in your life, marriage, ministry, and what ministry projects are you working on? Yeah, well, thanks for having me back, Dave. Uh, life's been busy. Uh, it's been a good year. This uh, is uh, my 20th anniversary with uh, my wife Erin. We've been married 20 years and so that's a special joy for us that we got to celebrate God's blessing on us these two decades. Uh, My son graduated from high school in May and so that was a milestone especially since uh, my wife homeschooled him a good part of the way so a bit of a victory there that we actually got there so without killing him so that was that was really great. And um, yeah, our church, uh, New Covenant Baptist Church, is in its 21st year and uh, thankful to see it healthy and thriving and growing. We, we're blessed and very thankful. And um, otherwise, yeah, writing projects, as, as you'll hear now, the, um, the book Strange Liar came out. And uh, actually, a second one I worked on independently, which was... Um, a devotional, 31 Days of Worship with Charles Spurgeon. So some writing projects. So it's been a good, productive, busy year. Well, before we get into Strange Liar, tell us about that devotional uh, on Charles Spurgeon. Yeah, so it's just a, um, what I did on my blog last year was I put together 31 days of a kind of a structured worship um, with a call to worship, a prayer of adoration, prayer of confession. Uh, so it's various readings as if you're almost in a in a church service following a kind of a nice structure of worship. But what I did is I gleaned prayers from Charles Spurgeon, some of his pulpit prayers. So it's as each day takes place as a prayer of adoration by Spurgeon, a prayer of confession, a prayer of illumination. I've also taken um, some of his exposition of the Psalms, put that together and structured it around some other scripture readings, call to worship, a reading of the law, an assurance of pardon. So it's very much like you were in a uh, a kind of a good Protestant worship service, but it's all, it's for private worship or family worship, and you're getting to read scripture and use the very rich imaginative and theological prayers of Spurgeon, along with his uh, his catechism, that is very doctrinally rich. So it's probably about 10 minutes a day and um, you can really enjoy a rich time of worship using some of Spurgeon's material alongside scripture. So yeah, 31 days of worship with Charles Spurgeon um, published there on Amazon. So it's um, hopefully a resource that will be a blessing to believers. Yeah, and I, I want to encourage you guys to go pick that up because David is a very solid writer and thinker, and and so uh, you'll be encouraged by and blessed by that. So please check that out. But um, guys, uh, we're going to talk today about uh, David's other book, uh, Strange Liar, The Penalization of Evangelical Worship. So can you tell us why you wrote this book and how you hope, how you hope it'll be received or is being received? Yeah, so Strange Liar... I obviously was kind of uh, t- playing off the title Strange Fire, the well-known conference on cessationism that came out of MacArthur's church. And here, Strange Liar, spelt L-Y-R-E, referring to the old musical instrument. I'm trying to talk about how a worship in uh, charismaticism is a very different animal to the worship in more um conservative or orthodox or protestant circles that it is a a different thing and in a a series of uh online articles that became this book 
I try to argue that um, charismatic worship has inserted itself in, even into those churches that are not charismatic. It has inserted itself in the actual lyrics in, and therefore in the theology, in the kind of music itself, and even in the entire structure, the form, the, the liturgy, as we would say, that this has is, is kind of uh, insidiously crept into non-charismatic churches through very popular songs and through worship that's being mimicked by non-charismatics, by cessationists. So I, I wrote it up partly to alert people that this is a different tradition. Uh, if you think it's correct, well, then 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 you got to argue for that. But what you shouldn't do is simultaneously say, "I'm not charismatic. I I don't believe a, in the charismatic theology, but I do think charismatic worship is helpful, and we're using that in our church." I'm arguing. I, I think that's a contradiction. Ultimately. Um, my hope is that believers will read it in the spirit it was written, which is not to be hostile, but to just draw people to see some of the history of uh, of this and where it's gone and where it could possibly take your church down the line. So that's the spirit in which it's written. I hope believers will find it helpful. No, I, I think that that is really, really uh, an important uh, thing because, and we need to say that again and again, um, there was an article uh, April 12th, uh, 2023 from Christianity Today titled, How Bethel and Hillsong Took Over Our Worship Sets. Have you, have you read that? No, I haven't, but I think I did see that article pointed to. It was quite a popular one now. Yeah, so... So they had uh, they they uh, rain, uh, found out all these. They looked at thirty eight songs that made the top twenty five list for the CCLI praise charts, and uh, thirty six of those songs had a, had ties to a group of four churches: Bethel, Hillsong, Passion City Church in Atlanta, Elevation in in uh, North Carolina. There with Stephen uh, Furtick. And basically, you know, all of uh, the point of the article, one of the points of the article is to show that a lot of the contemporary worship that, that we have to, to the point that you're raising in the book, it, it, it all comes out of these four churches. And we know that Bethel has abhorrent theology. We know that Hillsong has major issues. Of course, Elevation does, and, and so does uh, Passion. Um, and so... Yeah, I think that something like this where, you know, we need to understand um, more of how these things, how our worship needs to be rooted and grounded in the Bible and how it's how it's not. So I know that that's a, a large statement, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that the um, the problems that we have with um, some of these very, very popular charismatic churches and, and publishing houses is is threefold. The one is the theology. Um, there, there's obviously just some, as you said, very, very um, abhorrent the theology. Sometimes, though, what you'll find in the songs is it's not so much outright heresy, though you'll find that too, but it's shallowness. It's just a theological kind of banality. It's just vapid. Um, and so what is lost to believers is a discipleship character to the songs. Instead of being immersed in the kind of rich theology that you'd find in an Isaac Watts or Wesley or James Montgomery, where there's, there's just the gift of both the poetry and the rich religious imagination combined with profound theologies of God and his attributes, the Christian life, suffering, discipleship, obedience. You know, good Christian hymnody actually disciples us even while it elevates our affections towards God. The theological shallowness of these groups uh, produces more like a, a mantra-like singing where various um, rather cliched statements are simply repeated ad infinitum. And as these, these kind of statements are repeated, and this is something I mention in the book, it's a lot closer to old style paganism where certain things are chanted repeatedly so as to almost evoke a reaction 
rather than an engagement with the mind and the heart. I think that's the second problem is that these groups have a very different view of the emotions, the the passions and the affections than I think traditional Christianity does. Traditional Christianity views the human being as one who should be reached through his mind and his heart so that he will respond nobly and rightly and reverently towards God. In the charismatic view, it's a lot more a case of grabbing people by the gut, um, evoking very passionate and and almost appetitive responses through uh, very, very seductive music. The goal is not to persuade my heart. The goal is to sort of grab me at the level of my appetites. And that's a very different view of how Christians are shaped and persuaded. The traditional view, the biblical view, I think, is people must be shaped by the renewing of their mind. The the charismatic view is a lot more, and maybe they'll say I'm being unfair, I'm really not trying to be pejorative, but there's a manipulative ca- um, character to it where I'm using a very, again, very seductive music to almost charm you into the way I want you to go. So it's a very different view of the affections, a different view of how emotions function, how we should appeal to them, how we should use them. And that is quite different. And I think the third major difference and key problem is the er- the erasure of the line between entertainment and worship. There's There's a mixing up of categories here where certain groups really don't see them as different. Um, they see worship and entertainment almost as the same thing. They would just say entertainment is now directed towards God. But we would say that entertainment and worship are very different things. Entertainment is a consumable. Entertainment is done by passive spectators, whereas worship is a sacrifice of praise. Worship is an offering where I display how costly God is to me. That kind of difference is something that I think gets lost both in the lyrics, in the kind of music, and even in the overall presentation of uh, Pentecostal charismatic worship. So I think those three, theological shallowness, a different view of the affections, and not seeing worship and entertainment as different. These are are fairly serious problems that uh, I think Christians have got to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really good. And I mean, it, it, we'll just say in America, this is a huge problem, right? You have light shows and entertainment and, and this sort of emotional driven type of response to worship that is characterized by the the movements and the churches that uh we we even just mentioned you know uh passion hell song um uh, bethel um of course elevation so i mean just just look at that i mean it's we're not trying to we're not trying to attack or belittle or or anything those mm-hmm. particular churches it's not personal uh but but the, like i said there was an actual article an actual study done on this and and it was reported widely um i just pulled one article on it um and you're just drawing out out the point that this is a real problem and people need to be people need to be concerned about that just like here's where i'm going to go with this we're, we're we're often concerned about that the pastor you know preaches a faithful message but the, th- the problem, I think, is, is that we're not equally as concerned about how we respond to that message, i.e. our worship songs. And, mm-hmm. you know, we know from church history that, that uh, many, many, many uh, people were concerned about both. And so we have to be concerned about both today because these churches, especially Bethel, they're making tens and tens, if not even hundreds of millions of dollars um, on worship music, and it's fueling their uh, work. I don't. I don't want to call it a ministry. I was going to call it a. I don't even want to call it a ministry. Um, their work and in, in in through their churches, 
And so uh, we we have to we have to really understand that we have to if we're going to care about preaching, you have to care about worship. That's what I'm saying. Any any thoughts on that, brother? Yeah, you know that's such a great point. One of my um, professors and mentors once said to me, "There's two things you always need to bring before people. The first is who God is, and the second is what He deserves. Who He is is a question of truth." What he deserves is a question of love and the affections. And that's exactly what you're saying. Christianity is not merely informational. It's not simply a question of an information dump from one brain to another, as if the pastor has discharged his responsibility when he's simply given you the facts. And now you just take those facts in and the output will be perfect. No, no. Biblically, Christianity is not just informational, it's formational. We are formed, we are shaped very particularly by example and by exposure. So when I attend a corporate worship service, that entire service is like a catechism of my affections. It's it's telling me by virtue of what the leaders are doing, what they've permitted, what they've included, it's shaping me to say, so this is what God is like, and this is what he deserves. This is how you talk to him. Here's how you pray to him. Here's how you respond to him. This is what he deserves. Now, this kind of thing is more caught than taught. You know, it's like table manners. Your kids learn respect and reverence for their parents by being around those moments where mom and dad say, no, you don't talk to mom like that. You don't talk to dad like that. You say please and thank you. Well, corporate worship's like that. And the kind of music we use and the kind of lyrics we sing, the kind of atmosphere we create, yes, even down to the architecture and the lighting and the atmosphere, all of it is communicating to our people. God is like this and not like this. And you speak to him like this and not like that. So you can preach an orthodox message if you accompany that with worship that in some ways undermines or undercuts what you've just preached. It's kind of what, like what my friend, friend Scott Aniel said, you know, it's like, it's like giving people bubble gum for most of the service and then a steak at the end of the service. You have this meaty sermon and this kind of other stuff that makes up all the worship. And I think that's part of what this book is arguing against. You know, why would we, if we're not charismatic, have such a good theology of preaching and a good theology of God and his nature? But then when it comes to music and worship, there's just this disconnect. And we just kind of contradict all that we were saying about form, about beauty, about reverence, about excellence about truth and suddenly we just undercut all that undo it and do the opposite uh and and sing like charismatics it's a strange phenomenon but it's growing i'm afraid yeah you know you you probably would know uh, and be able to explain this better than me because uh, it's been a while since i've read religious affections by jonathan edwards but i can't help but notice how you're talking is is the same sort of way that you know edwards in the first great awakening and of course we know that he was deeply concerned even even back then before the second great awakening happened and of course we know uh, uh, some of this if not most of a lot of what we're facing now has come out of this uh second great awakening with its charles feeney and its emotional you know manipulation and and respond respond maybe that's a maybe that's the wrong way to say that but i'm I'm just meaning this overly emotional kind of response but you know edwards was deeply concerned at his time to note the evidences and the marks of revival and how people were responding and you're kind of i think uh if i'm picking up on this right you're kind of picking up on that is that right brother yeah, that's, that is right. And Edwards is so helpful if you read him rightly and understand what he was getting at. Um, Edwards was in the middle of the, the first great awakening in, in uh, New England and thereabouts. So he got a, received a lot of criticism. A lot of people were against the revival. So Edwards defended it and was trying to distinguish between true and false. 
And he was trying to distinguish between true affections, true responses to God of the heart versus fake ones and phony ones and merely, um, to use 18th century language, enthusiasm, which was the older way of saying just kind of wild, overly emotional um, responses. And why that's helpful for us today is because very often in the debate between charismatics and non-charismatics, cessationists and non-cessationists or continuationists, that it, it kind of comes down to a, a very uh, superficial analysis of emotions. And you'll find people saying things like, well, you guys just don't like emotion and you have a problem with emotion in worship. And Edwards really has already dealt with that for, for us. He has said very helpfully that he wanted affections raised as high as possible so long as they were affected with nothing but truth. It was distinguished between true affections that were true responses to the true God versus mere passions, which were appetites or whimsical kind of desires or merely kind of uh, on-the-spot responses that were far more guttural and visceral and were not really based in truth. So Edwards is not against emotion, uh, to use that term, neither am I. And in fact, when it is based in truth, we want it to be lively, we want it to be experiential, we want it to be deeply reverential, we want it to be powerfully evocative, we want it to be joyful and celebratory, depending on what truth we're looking at. We don't want less of that. We want more of that, provided that it is a true and right response to who God is. Now, what we have today is people wanting emotions for their own sake. We, we want the experience of the joy. We want the experience of the sort of tearful moment but it's not as important to us how we got that, how that was evoked. Now, that is truly what we call sentimentalism. Or to put it another way, it's just feeling your feelings. It's, it's trying to just take joy in your joy or feel gladness in your gladness. And ironically, God then just becomes an instrument. He just becomes a means to get those feelings. Uh, that's one of our primary objections to what we're seeing in a lot of charismatic worship. And it's what Edwards himself was arguing against. He was saying, we don't just want emotion for its own sake. We want desires and affections raised by an exposure to who God really is. Then let's raise them as high as we possibly can, as long as people are affected by truth. That's really good, brother. Really good. But we're, we're in the middle of a series on this podcast. We're talking about suffering. How does a good understanding of worship help Christians prepare for and deal with suffering? I think a right understanding of suffering orients us away from self and towards God and others. You know, the book of Hebrews says that we are to offer a sacrifice of praise you know, we don't use that language enough that that worship is sacrifice. David said when he was offered the land that became the temple's land from Arona or or Nun, he he um he says, you know, I, I'm not gonna offer the Lord that which costs me nothing. He he wanted worship to cost. Sacrifice is cost. Well, I think when we understand that that informs our entire approach to life and Christianity. We realize that the Christian life is a life of giving up ourselves. We give ourselves up for Christ. And therefore, suffering is a normal path for believers. Um, Peter tells us, you know, do not think it's something strange that has happened to you when you suffer. This is, in fact, the normal Calvary road for God's people. Now, I think when people treat worship like a consumable, people who want to be entertained by worship, sadly, what they're doing is they're still placing themselves in the center of their world. They, they're placing themselves at the center of their own Christian life, and they're setting themselves up to be deeply disappointed, shocked, perhaps even bewildered and thrown when the trials of life come. Um, you know, as Jesus told us in the parable of the soils, 
the those the second and third soil where the shallow soil uh he says you know when the heat of trials came you know that it was scorched and they forsook the faith the third one they choked by riches and the cares of this life and troubles i i think that when you have a right theology of worship where you're seeing the worth of god the costliness of his nature the beauty of god and that you're willing to worship him in spite of your feelings that it's not really about you that prepares you to face life as it really is which is to see that god is seeking to create in us true image bearers of jesus christ that he's willing to put us through the fire to produce faith that's like gold um and that there's something that's more important here than just me feeling good and feeling comfortable and i think when we graduate from an infantile view of worship where it's just all about feeling entertained to one where we're willing to break that alabaster flask over the lord's feet and give him our best this prepares us for all of life it's discipleship right it's living a life of sacrifice for christ that's that's so good brother that that is that is so good cuz cuz we 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 tend to I think, uh, especially I think in America, we tend to compartmentalize our, our worship, right? We say this part of my life is worship, i.e. I'm going to church on Sunday, but then we miss out on the fact that we're being prepared for the rest of the week. We're gathering together, and then God sends us out, um, which is also part of our worship, right, to what? to to do our vocation to love our families to to serve and all of that is equally an act of worship and in the middle of our worship what are we going to face like you're talking about suffering we're going to face hardship we're going to face challenges so we're being prepared in in the corporate gathering for and to face um the world and and um to help one another with whatever we have going on so Yeah, and you just think about how some of the uh, the greater hymns of the faith actually sing about suffering. You know, how firm a foundation, you know, as as the the writers of takes us through lines from the prophet Isaiah and how the uh we going to come through trials refined like gold. There's so many hymns that really even help us with trials and help us to think through them rather than those hymns or at least those songs today that very often are about us you know a lot of the modern choruses are actually just songs about our own worship that we are here to worship and we're feeling good and god is here and we're feeling him and once again the the focus is on self we walk out of that and we've been shaped to really just think about our own experience and how happy we think we feel about god Monday comes and there's bills to pay and there's problems in the marriage and the kids are rebellious and there's a health issue how are you shaped by Sunday to experience that if you sang meaty theology with music that was reverently beautiful and joyful if you read scriptures that were filled with the promises of god if you heard an expository sermon you're built up and you're ready to face life as it is but if you went to church to kind of just get a little bit of a spiritual pick me up and to make you feel a little bit better about yourself and everything was kind of just a bit fun the chances are you haven't been prepared to face life and when the storms of life hit you that week your faith is a million miles away um because your shepherds didn't do a good job at uh, helping you be nourished and ready for life as you were going to face it out there. So, and as we said earlier, worship is is a big part of discipleship. It's shaping believers to be mature followers of Christ who can take up their cross and follow him. Yeah, that's really good, brother. Well, we're talking about worship music and it, and it hits me as we're, we're we've been talking uh, what can pastors do to make sure that worship music in the in the local church is biblically grounded and shaped and theologically rock solid in their churches? Yeah, I would uh, I would just encourage my my brother pastors to, you know, first of all, just seek consistency. You know, the same kind of care and um, 
carefulness that you're showing as you study the scriptures, as you prepare sermons, don't delegate that out to the music team as if this is something that you don't have pastoral responsibility for. That same discernment that God has given you to make sure that you have sound doctrine, that same discernment will function for your oversight of worship. You don't have to be a musician to have a sense of discernment that says, this kind of song is helping the sheep in my church love Christ and love him ordinately. So my first advice would be, don't compartmentalize your church in such a way that you are farming out all the songs and the worship to the worship team. Take pastoral oversight of what is sung and what is done in church. Even if you're not musical, even if you're not the guy who's going to be playing the songs or leading the singing, you should still be the one who has the final say over what will be sung because both Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.18 and 19 tell us that when the word of Christ dwells in us richly and when we're filled with the Spirit, we'll be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We'll be teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. These are powerfully communicative. And in our teaching office as shepherds, we need to take oversight of what is sung. Uh, I think the second thing then is don't measure yourself off what is popular uh, in the culture right now what is necessarily bringing in the crowds in the seeker-friendly churches. Rather, make your standard that which really accords with truth. For that, I would encourage you to get a good hymnal. Um, at the very least, listen to what the church sang for hundreds of years before this moment. Uh, you don't have to use that, but you should at least give it a chance. You should at least say, okay, what did my Christian answer? Sisters, sing and say to God. That's got to count for something. You know, as G.K. Chesterton said, you know, the democracy of the dead. Let the dead sit at the table and at least have a vote as well. So listen to what they've done, hear what they've written, and at least give it give it a chance. When you've done that and you 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 soaked in good theology, you're at least giving tradition a chance and you're taking pastoral oversight, at that point, I would say, just keep educating yourself. Read the best books uh, by conservative, thoughtful authors about music, about worship, and then make your decisions in terms of how you're going to scrutinize hymns and music. It's obviously a long discussion. It's a complex discussion. There's a lot of nuances, lots of sophistication as we have to look at the topics of culture, the topics of music, the topics of of poetry, but it's worth doing because this is a huge part of how our people are shaped. Um, and if we delegate it to immature people, they're going to be shaping our people in bad ways. So we've got to pick up the slack even where maybe we weren't educated musically or culturally or any of those areas as pastors, we've just got to say, hey, I've got to know this on some level um, so as to be a blessing to my people. Yeah, that's really good. And and I, uh, if I can, um, and if you have any additional recommendations, feel free. Um, I would I recommend three resources. One is Hymns of Grace. It's really good. Um, so you can go to hymnsofgrace.com and find that. Uh, of course, G3, um, our, our publisher, uh, it, it has a great resource uh, hymnal, uh, Psalms and Hymns to the Living God. Uh, they have some a full list of hymns on their website that you can Google that. Uh, G, I just Googled G3 hymnal and found that, um, and that they have that free. And then they have a book uh, called Hymns to the Living God. So Yeah, I'd highly recommend those. Um, hymns to the Living God is the hymnal that our church uses. Um, it's, um, it's a great resource. So, and what a good hymnal does is it kind of gives you a little bit of a, a, a standard, kind of a canon. Um, you know, today, as we can just use our laptops and we can um, just download the, you know, the latest song for this week, while that's a tremendous technology and I have nothing against that, 
one difficulty that it does is it it makes our collection of hymns so open-ended that we may not have a sense of a collection. Now, what a what a good hymnal does, it's not that it's saying this is the last word or the final statement of the only hymns that may be sung. It's not saying that at all. But what it is saying is within the limits of these two covers, we're suggesting these are excellent representations of Christian hymnody. Here is a, a spread of hymns from multiple continents, multiple eras, multiple uh, peoples, uh, even multiple theologies within the orthodox stream of gospel Christianity. And we believe th these sentiments represent Christian affections. What you have when you pick up that hymnal is you have a curated collection of how Christians have responded to God, what they've thought he's worth. And that counts for a lot. Uh, because it really gives me a kind of a boundary with, within which to move. Um, if all I have today is Google, it's so open-ended that um, it, it's really difficult to know where to begin and where to end. So a really good hymnal is, is a great at least starting point to say, you know, what counts for good hymnody? Uh, you might not agree with the editor's choices. You don't have to. It's not inspired but it's really helpful to give you that sense of here, here is a collection worth singing, worth knowing. That's really good, brother. That's really good. Well, can you please tell our listeners and those who watch more about where they can find you, uh, more about you and your ministry? Yeah, well, I, I'm privileged to pastor New Covenant Baptist Church in Johannesburg, South Africa. So I've been there for uh, 21 years now. And if you want to see more information on the church, it's uh, NCBC, New Covenant Baptist Church, .co .za. Um, I write, my personal blog is at churcheswithoutchests.net. That title's taken from C.S. Lewis's Men Without Chests. So it's Churches Without Chests, where I just write about a range of different topics. Um, some of those articles are printed on G3 as well. So if you go to g3min.org, um, you'll find some of my material. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad as well to do a, a radio program uh, in South Africa that's broadcast uh, through much of Central South Africa. The program's name is Bible Perspective. And uh, it has a website as well, bibleperspective.co.za. You can find some of my books on Amazon if you just uh, look for Strange Liar or War Without Words or my, the most recent one, 31 Days of Worship with Charles Spurgeon. Uh, you'll you'll find them on Amazon and um, hopefully they'll be a help to you. That's great, brother. I, we, well, I encourage people to check out your other work and your website and all those things as well. Uh, just as we wrap up today's conversation, can you give us a few takeaways, brother? Yeah, I just want to encourage believers in the kind of murky waters of worship. Um, know that it's it's not impenetrable. It's not a forest that you can never see your way through. Truly, if you desire to love and worship God as he is and know him as he is, God rewards that. The Bible promises that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The only thing that gets in the way is our hearts that, want to be at the center. We want to worship our worship. We want to just feel our feelings. But we can set that aside and say, I want to know God as he is because God's bigger than my heart. And the true encounter with the true God is much bigger than any man-made entertainment, than any man-made emotional responses. So I'm really encouraging believers, press deeper into the knowledge of God I feel charismatic worship will leave you short and it will abandon you. Um, it's not what it's cracked up to be. So I'm hoping that you'll see in Strange Liar an alternative. Pursue the God who is because you won't be disappointed with him. That's really good, brother. Well, we've been talking today with our friend and brother uh, David uh, about his book, Strange Liar, The Penalization of Evangelical Worship. Uh, published by G3 Press. We want to encourage you to
go ahead and pick up that book from G3 on their website. Uh, go to G3 men dot, uh, is it com or dot org? I can't remember. I think it's, yeah, I think it's demon.org. Yeah. So, so go there at the top of the menu, you can click uh, press and uh, you'll find David's book and all the other books that they have. And uh, thank you, brother, so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. It's been a joy. Yeah. Same here. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.